Okay, we're on. Oh, shoot. I forgot to start it with the music. Well, anyway, hey, Norm, sit down. Stop being crazy, Doug. <clears throat> All right, when is men responsible, Moritz Schlick? With hesitation and reluctance, I prepare to add this chapter to the discussion of ethical problems. For in it, I must speak, for in it, I must speak of a matter which even at present is thought to be a fundamental ethical problem, but which got into ethics and has become a much discussed problem only because of a misunderstanding. We're starting to see the pattern now, right? So Moritz Schlick is probably going to be a compatibilist, right? Okay. This is the so-called problem of the freedom of the will. Moreover, this pseudo problem has long since been settled by the efforts of certain sensible persons and above all, the state of affairs just described has been often disclosed with exceptional clarity by Hume. Hence, it is really one of the greatest scandals of philosophy that again and again, so much paper and printer's ink is devoted to this matter, to say nothing of the expenditure of thought, which could have been applied to more important problems, assuming that it would have sufficed for these. Thus, I should truly be ashamed to write a chapter on freedom. In the chapter heading, the word responsible indicates that indicates what concerns ethics and designates the point at which misunderstanding arises. So we're going to see that he's more like Lewis, right? He's going to say the problem with our words is on the responsibility side, not like Mill who said it's on the causality side. <clears throat> Therefore, the concept of responsibility continues our theme. And if in the process of its clarification, I must also speak of the concept of freedom, I shall, of course, say only what others have already said before, consoling myself with the thought that in this way alone can anything be done to put an end at last to that scandal. The main task of ethics is to explain moral behavior. To explain means to refer back to laws. Every science, including psychology, is possible only insofar as there are such laws to which the events can be referred. Since the assumption that all events are subject to universal laws is called the principle of causality, one can also say every science presupposes the principle of causality. Therefore, every explanation of human behavior must also assume the validity of causal laws. In this case, the existence of psychological laws. So far, so good, right? Setting it up the way you would expect. <clears throat> All of our, uh, we're starting to get used to the idea that we can anticipate where this, generally where the argument might be going, right? So he's saying, look, we've got to, in order to think and make any predictions at all, we've got to think in this deterministic kind of way. But we have this illusion that that means that we're not free. And so he's in this compatibilist camp, and we'll see how he tries to say that we still have responsibility. All of our experience strengthens us in the belief that this presupposition is realized, excuse me, is realized at least to the extent required for all purposes of practical life in intercourse with nature and human beings, and also for the most precise demands of technique. Whether indeed the principle of causality holds universally, whether it is whether that is determinism is true, we do not know. No one knows. Okay, so that's interesting. He's, he's agreeing with William James in that, right? He's saying this, you can't know for sure that what Paul Ray is claiming that there's an overarching principle of causality that's universal and never can be broken. But you also can't know that it can be broken. You just can't know. Okay, so that's that's a little different from the typical things that are usually, um, well, in any case, let's keep going. But we do know that it is possible to settle the dispute between determinism and indeterminism by mere reflection and speculation, by the consideration of so many reasons for and so many reasons against, which collectively and individually are but pseudo reasons. Such an attempt becomes especially ridiculous when one considers with what enormous expenditure of experiential and logical skill 
Contemporary physics carefully approaches the question of whether causality can be maintained for the most minute intra-atomic events. Fortunately, it is not necessary to lay claim to a final solution of the causal problem in order to say that to say what is necessary in ethics concerning responsibility. Okay, that's interesting. So his argument for why we're still responsible might be based on well, what has to be true for ethics to be a meaningful subject. Fortunately, we don't have to settle if determinism is universally true. We can't ever know anyway, but we don't have to. All we have to know is what's necessary in ethics concerning responsibility. There is required only an analysis of the concept, the careful determination of the meaning, which is in fact joined to the words responsibility and freedom, as these are actually used. If men had made clear to themselves the sense of these propositions, which we use in everyday life, that pseudo argument, which lies at the root of the pseudo problem and which recurs thousands of times within and outside philosophical books would never have arisen. All right. It's clear what argument he's going to try to make. He's going to say, if we examine the ideas of freedom, if we examine the ideas of responsibility, we will see that there's nothing in them that are challenged by or a challenge to determinism. Determinism could be universally true. And of course it would have nothing to do with this. So let's see how he does that. The argument runs as follows. If determinism is true, if that is, all events obey immutable laws, then my will too is always determined by my innate character and my motives. Hence, my decisions are necessary, not free. But if so, then I am not responsible for my acts, for I would be accountable for them only if I could do something about the way my decisions went. But I can do nothing about it since they proceed with necessity from my character and the motives, and I have made neither and have no power over those, over them. The motives come from without, and my character is the necessary product of the innate tendencies and the external influences which have been effective during my lifetime. Thus, determinism and moral responsibility are incompatible. Moral responsibility presupposes freedom, that is, exemption from causality. So he's setting up the determinist argument. This process of reasoning rests upon a whole series of confusions, series of them, just as the links of a chain hang together. Oh, that's funny. We must show these confusions to be such and thus destroy them. Okay, so here's his, he's going to set forth and clarify. Two meanings of the word law. It all begins with an erroneous interpretation of the meaning of law. In practice, that is understood as a rule by which the state prescribes certain behaviors to its citizens. These rules often contradict the natural desires of the citizens, for if they do not do so, there would be no reason for making them, and are in fact not allowed by many, of, are not followed by many of them, while others obey, but under compulsion. The state does, in fact, compel its citizens by imposing certain sanctions, punishment, which serve to bring their desires into harmony with the, with the prescribed laws. Serves to bring their desires. It's deterministic, all right? Okay. In natural science, on the other hand, the word law means something quite different. The natural law is not a prescription as to how something should behave, but a formula, a description of how something does, in fact, behave. The two forms of laws have only this in common. Both tend to, exp to be expressed in formulae. Otherwise, they would have absolutely nothing to do with one another, and it is very blameworthy that the same word has been used for two such different things but even more so that philosophers should have allowed themselves to be led into serious error by this usage. Since natural laws are only descriptions of what happens, there can be in regards to them no talk of compulsion. The laws of celestial mechanics do not prescribe to the planets how they have to move, as though the planets would actually like to move quite otherwise and are only forced by these burdensome laws of Kepler to move in orderly paths. No, these laws do not in any way compel the planets, but express only what in fact planets actually do. 
we've seen a lot of this in Mill, right? This should be a pretty familiar line of reasoning. It's well expressed here and it's quite interesting, but we've seen a similar move in Mill. Okay. If we apply this to volition, we are enlightened at once, even before the other confusions are discovered. When we say that a man's will obeys psychological laws, these are not civic laws which compel him to make certain decisions or dictate desires to him, which he would in fact prefer not to have. They are laws of nature, merely expressing which desires he actually has under given conditions. They describe the nature of the will in the same manner as the astronomical laws describe the nature of planets. Compulsion occurs where man is prevented from realizing his natural desires. How could the rule according to which these natural desires arise itself be considered as compulsion? Compulsion and necessity. But this is the second confusion to which the first leads almost inevitably. After conceiving the laws of nature anthropomorphically, as order imposed nolens volens upon the events, one adds to them the concept of necessity. This word, derived from need, also comes to us from practice and is used there in the sense of inescapable compulsion. To apply the word with this meaning to natural laws is, of course, senseless, for the presupposition of an opposing desire is lacking, and it is then confused with something altogether different, which is actually an attribute of natural laws, that is, universality. It is of the essence of natural laws to be universally valid, for only when we have found a rule which holds of events without exception, do we call the law, the rule of law, the rule, a law of nature, right? So this is interesting. We talked about this earlier in, in I think, um, Lewis, maybe it was Lewis, maybe it was Mill. There's this idea that, okay, wait a minute. If we just embrace the deterministic argument and, and understand it far enough and say, wait a minute, this is so universal that it's almost a tautology. You're not really claiming that my struggles to strive in one direction are forced and compelled by the Big Bang. What you're saying is something so vague and basic that everybody agrees with it, but that it has no bearing on whether or not I, I am free. Because all you're really saying is that things behave the way they behave or something like that. So he's making that move here. Let's see. So to say that it's universal is to take this thing out of it. Nothing could be otherwise. That's not the power of your argument. That's the weakness of what you think it implies. To a writer like Schlick, that's the kind of argument he'll make. I'm not saying that's the case, but that's an interesting argument. That's quite powerful to some degree. I think there's something to it. Okay. It is of the essence of natural laws to be universally valid for only when we have found a rule which holds, I'll say this again, holds of events without exception, do we call the rule a law of nature. Thus, when we say a natural law holds necessarily, this has but one legitimate meaning. It holds in all cases where it is applicable. It is, again, very deplorable that the word necessary has been applied to natural laws or what amounts to the same to the same thing with reference to causality. For it is quite superfluous since the expression universally valid is available. Universally valid is something altogether different from compulsion. These concepts belong to spheres so remote from each other that one insight into the error has been gained, that once insight into the error has been gained, one can no longer conceive the possibility of a confusion. How could someone, he's saying, possibly confuse these two things? They're so, they're so unrelated to each other. To say the law applies universally isn't to say it's, you know, when you say it's necessary, that's what you're really saying. You don't mean it's forcing itself and all it has to be and you can't riot against it. It's it's saying the, the, the principle applies always. That, that has nothing to do with making things happen. 
The confusion of two concepts always carries with it the confusion of their, contradi of their contradictory opposites. That's an interesting idea. The opposites of the universal validity of a formula is the of the existence of a law is the non-existence of a law, indeterminism, a causality. While the opposition of compulsion is what in practice everyone calls freedom. <clears throat> okay, so this is something new. We've never heard this before. This is quite interesting. He's saying, okay, like Mill, I'm going to say these two things are totally opposite from each other. So I can embrace determinism if I recognize it means universally applicable laws that are really just descriptors, not anthropomorphized legal in the legal sense, but are just descriptors of the regularity of behavior, what Mill calls the, the regularity of sequence and all of this. I can understand that that's what it is, and it has nothing to do with compulsion and forcing and making things be other than they would want to be and things like that. So it applies everywhere it applies, and so it's necessary that it always be true, but that just means it's universally applicable. But then he says something that Mill also seems to believe, but he says it quite explicitly and interesting here is that what makes the what Mill would call the metaphysical libertarians strive to find a causality and strive to find something that is not deterministic, indeterministic, is this fact that they're making the same mistake, right? So he's a compatibilist. He's arguing that we have free will, but he's also arguing that the determinist principle is completely untouched by that. So he's he's saying, I have my cake and eat it too, right? So he's rescuing free will, and you may say, good, so he's a libertarian. No, he's a compatibilist. He's saying, also, don't give up on these principles of thought that allow us to understand things and are obviously always correct and where they apply. And so he's doing both at the same time. And so now he's going to switch and start criticizing the libertarians, for making the, the analogous mistake or the other side of the coin mistake and say, wait a minute, you're looking for something that's outside rationality and causality that's just magic and impossible to predict because you think that would give you freedom? That idea is so disconnected from freedom just as much because it's the opposite of the mistake that the determinists are making, where they think, oh, it must be compulsion if the law always applies. You say, well, I want something that doesn't follow laws and isn't reasonable in order to have real freedom. It's like, well, how free would you be if you yourself couldn't know how you were going to act? If no one could possibly make sense of your actions, I wouldn't call them free. <laughs> Excuse me. They might be random. They might be chaotic. They might be incomprehensible, but they're incomprehensible. You don't know that they're free. They're just chaos. They're just insanity. That's that's no freedom that you should be wanting in the first place, he would say, right? I'm not saying that's the case, but his argument, it's it's becoming quite clear now that he's he's a compatibilist. He wants the determinism as rightly understood, and he wants it in its place, and he wants to clarify and separate it from the confusion of thinking that means I'm compelled. But at the same time, he's saying, look, you don't need some metaphysical, as Mill would say, some magical outside the chain of causality thing, because that thing doesn't compel you at all. That's rationality. Don't give that up because you think it gives you freedom. It wouldn't. Th those two would be as different from each other as well. Okay. Let's see here. So the opposite of the universal validity of the formula. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> The opposite of compulsion is what in practice everyone calls freedom. He, so the opposite of compulsion is freedom and the opposite of determinism is indeterminism or a causality. Those are just as unrelated. Freedom and a causality are as unrelated, right? If you, if your decision you're making isn't the thing that causes your action, if it's uncaused, your if your action is uncaused, you didn't cause it. You see, you're not the free agent making it happen if it's uncaused. You shouldn't want a causality. You shouldn't want indeterminism if you want freedom. What you need for freedom is I wanted this and I got it and I made it happen because I chose it. So it's me that's responsible. If you want to break it away from causality, well, wait a minute. Now we don't know if you're the cause of the thing at all. That's what he's going to say. He's going to say that, that's not desirable if you want freedom. Okay. Here emerges the nonsense trailing through centuries that freedom means exemption from the causal principle or not subject to the laws of nature. 
Hence, it is believed necessary to valid to vindicate indeterminism in order to save human freedom. Excuse me. Freedom and indeterminism. Let's look at him and clarify that now. This is quite mistaken. Ethics has, so to speak, no moral interest in the purely theoretical question of determinism and indeterminism but only a theoretical interest, namely insofar as it seeks the laws of conduct and can find them only to the extent that causality holds. It's looking for, it should want the opposite. But the question of whether man is morally free, that is, has that freedom which, as we shall show, is the presupposition of moral responsibility, is altogether different from the problem of determinism. Hume was especially clear on this point. He indicated the inadmissible confusion of the concepts of indeterminism and freedom, but he retained inappropriately the word freedom for both, calling the one freedom of the will, the other genuine kind freedom of conduct. He showed that morality is interested only in the latter and that such freedom is, and that such freedom in general is unquestionably to be attributed to mankind. Well, he gave an argument for it, but yeah, that's his conclusion. And this is quite correct, right? He agrees with Mill clearly. Freedom means the opposite of compulsion. A man is free if he does not act under compulsion, and he is compelled or unfree when he is hindered from without, <clears throat> when he is hindered from without in the realization of his natural desires. This has to be a typo. Freedom means the opposition of compulsion. A man is free if he does not act under compulsion and he is compelled or unfree when he is hindered from, when he is hindered from without in the realization of his natural desires. Got it. Hence, he is unfree when he is locked up or chained or when someone forces him at the point of a gun to do what otherwise he would not do. This is quite clear, and everyone will admit that the everyday or legal notion of the lack of freedom is quite is thus correctly interpreted, and that a man will be considered quite free and responsible if no such external compulsion is exerted upon him. There are certain cases which lie between these clearly described ones, as, say, when someone acts under the influence of alcohol or a narcotic. In such cases, we consider the man to be more or less unfree and hold him less accountable. <clears throat> because we rightly view the influence of the drug as external, even though it is found within the body, it prevents him from making decisions in the manner peculiar to his nature. If he takes the narcotic of his own will, we make him completely responsible for this act and transfer a part of the responsibility to of of the responsibility to the consequences, making, as it were, an average or mean condemnation of the whole. In the case of a person who is mentally ill, we do not consider him free with respect to those acts in which the disease expressed itself, because we view the illness as a disturbing factor which hinders the normal functioning of the natural tendencies. We make not him but his disease responsible. Okay, so he's clarifying the right notion of freedom, which is, of course, completely compatible with predictable descriptors, right? With that, that idea of causality that he thinks is necessary for all of that talk. And it is, right? We could look really quickly at his idea of, of um, the two clear concepts. So let's look at the alcohol in the middle. And he says, okay, there's kind of a spectrum here. There's the man who is not drunk, who chooses to do something, and we say, you chose to do that. Then there's the man who's been slipped a mickey, right? He, he normally wouldn't act this way, but somebody poisoned him with alcohol or with a drug. And so we say, well, wait a minute. It's not really his fault because he didn't choose to, to take that drug, and it totally affected the way he was going to act. And so, you know, maybe deep down inside he was in he was inclined to act that way, but if you didn't give him the disinhibitor, he never would have chosen to do it. So it's mostly not his fault, mostly in that case. And then there's in the middle ground, he says, where, well, a man chose to get drunk. And so it's, we can sort of say, well, you wouldn't normally act that way. It's not exactly the way you would choose to act. However, you did choose to get drunk. 
And you obviously, the way you acted expresses your natural inclination. And so you are inclined to act that way. And maybe you took the disinhibitors so that you could get the courage to act that way. So you're kind of, to one degree or another, more responsible that way than if you had just been poisoned against your will. But maybe a little less so than if you had, you know, maybe it's like, well, you had some drinks and you didn't expect to be in that circumstance at that time. And so the disinhibitors that you took for other reasons have have changed the way you normally would have acted. So we kind of blame you a little bit less. But, you, you know, so he's just describing the spectrum. The point for his argument is that the only way to say you're responsible is to say that there's a principle of causality, that there's a principle of psychology that can say you made this decision and that led to this. And it's all describable with the same kind of language that describes why the planets rotate round, why they follow elliptical paths. It's like, well, this is its nature and here's what we pr predict it will do. And he says, being able to describe it that way is what's necessary to say you're responsible. You shouldn't want to believe that you just chaotically do things that no one could predict. That's not a character. That's not something that you should be proud of. That's just you being insane or you being uh, completely unfathomable. And who the hell thinks you're responsible then? I mean, maybe you are, but who knows what's responsible if there's no causal links. Okay. <clears throat> the nature of responsibility. But what does this really signify? What do we mean by this concept of responsibility, which goes along with that of freedom and which plays such an important role in morality? It is easy to attain complete clarity in this matter. We need only carefully determine the manner in which the concept is used. What is the case in practice when we impute responsibility to a person. What is our aim in doing this? The judge has to discover who is responsible for a given act in order that he may punish him. We are inclined to be less concerned with the inquiry as to who deserves reward for an act, and we have no special officials for this, but of course the principle would be the same. But let us stick to punishment in order to make the idea clear. What is punishment actually? The view still often expressed is it is a natural retaliation for past wrong ought no longer to be defended in cultivated society for the opinion that an increase in sorrow can be made good again by further sorrow is altogether barbarous. We should really have a side discussion about this whole punishment thing because from Paul Ray on, pretty much every philosopher has said, deterrence is the only justification for punishment. And it's interesting that 99% of philosophers basically feel that way. The only sense of punishment that makes sense to them, I mean, from Socrates on, Socrates is like, who would punish their enemies for wrong? Do you make anybody better by punishment? Do you, you don't make anything better by punishment. So the only justification that the philosophers seem to think it's not retributive. It's not, usually it's also not um, reformative. Like, oh, we're going to make you a rehabilitative is the word they use. We're going to rehabilitate you and make you a better person this way. It's generally just, we're trying to deter you from doing this again. We're trying to deter others from doing it. And it, I think it's interesting that philosophers um, philosophers tend to think the other two ideas are pretty much nonsense and unjustifiable. And that's not all philosophers, but this is now what the eighth time that, you know, anybody we've read so far who brings up punishment says, well, deterrence makes sense and nothing else makes sense as a justification for it. That should be a flag for you, a green flag or a red flag. You should notice that and say to yourself, huh, where did these other ideas come from if philosophers didn't invent them, you know? And why is it that they used to be more powerful? Maybe they still are. And is there maybe more truth to them? And philosophers just haven't been able to figure it out yet. Or maybe it shows the sickness of humanity without philosophy of how we would go off really crazy bad roads if we didn't have people thinking seriously. And hey, all the people who think seriously come to this conclusion. So that's a good sign that maybe they're right. And 
and there's something else that's motivating us to come to that. But we also might say maybe there's something in the nature of thinking seriously and being the sort of person who can think seriously that you're blind to perversion and wickedness and you're, you're sort of blind to things that maybe are necessary to comprehend in order to think about punishment in these other ways because after all they've emerged as concepts that matter to us so that's a huge other discussion and it's a totally other philosophical discussion but we, we should just mention that hey there's there's a whole debate right there where we could do a whole section on and, and really you know we, there's lots of books you could read on that and it's just I just notice it's interesting that every philosopher agrees with this idea. And um, so that's something we should think, huh, there's work to be done in that field. Maybe we should find out what the answers are there since everybody's agreeing. And one of the instincts of being a philosopher is we need some disagreement. If everybody's agreeing, uh, it's either boring and uninteresting to me, or we better desperately find someone that can cause us to question ourselves because we're not doing it ourselves. And we're aimed at argument and at disagreement. We don't we don't want things settled in that sense. That's not our inclination. Okay. It's not how philosophy advances. All right. What is punishment actually? It's basically any civilized people would say it's just for deterrence and nothing else. Okay. Certainly the, or the origin of punishment may lie in an impulse of retaliation or vengeance. But what is such an impulse except the instinctive desire to destroy the cause of the deed to be avenged? Which is quite a good argument. By the destruction of or injury to the malefactor, punishment is concerned only with the institution of causes, of motives, of conduct, and this alone is its meaning. Punishment is an educative measure, and as such, is a means to the formation of motives which are in part to prevent the wrongdoer from repeating the act. He calls that reformation. And in part to prevent others from committing a similar act. Intimidation, he calls that. Analogously, in the case of reward, we are concerned with an incentive. Okay, so I think his reformation and intimidation are really just two words he's using to distinguish two kinds of deterrence. Um, it, it, I think that's all under deterrence. I don't think his reformation is something like um, rehabilitation. But uh, that, that's quite an interesting argument, right? You know, why do you want, why do you have an instinct to punish someone? Because you're trying to get rid of the source of the problem. Well, that's deterrence. You don't have an extra retributive um, justification like he wronged me, I shall wrong him and the universe shall be set right by his pain and suffering. Like, if with the philosopher here, this is a side note, we're not really talking about determinism here, and we'll get to his point again in a second before we move on. But on a side note here, what's interesting is that he's saying, okay, if I could tell you that your punishment of him will cause him to do the act 10 more times instead of zero more times, he did it once, it was a crime of passion, he's not likely to do it again. But if you put him in jail and make him a worse person and make him hang out with psychopaths, he'll become more likely to do more crimes in the future. Then Schlick would say, actually, that's a bad punishment. We should find a different punishment because the whole justification for punishment is to make it less likely for it to happen. Whereas some people would have the instinct and he says it's wrong. He says they would have the instinct that says, no, you do something bad, something bad has to happen to you. And basically every philosopher looks at that idea and goes, ew, no, 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 I'm sorry. Not in a cultivated people, as, as Schlick would say, but also not in a serious ethical attitude of Socrates, who would say, no, you make men worse in order to deal with the problem of bad things happening. No, 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 no. Let's not do that. Um, and, and it's also important, we'll notice one other thing, which is even Paul Ray agrees with this. Even Paul Ray agrees with a determinist, uh, in his determinism, with a deterrent philosophy of punishment. It's like, well, yes, because I believe that we have no free will, we better punish people so that we can push them in the direction of what we find agreeable. Well, Schlick here agrees with that, except he says, well, but they're free. That's why the punishment works, right? The punishment works because determinism is true and the punishment works because they have choices to make and we are affecting, we're, we're making it harder for them to make that choice. 
So to get back to the main argument, what he's saying, what the point of what he's saying here, despite the fact that it's quite interesting to talk about legal theories, and we'll, we'll do more of that in other classes, is to do this, is to say, look, none of what I'm saying makes any sense unless people behave in a regular sequence of events where you can describe through psychological laws what it's likely. If I say, I here's a law, people don't want to be tormented their whole lives. So if all of society will torment you for eating ice cream on a Sunday, you'll be less likely to eat ice cream on a Sunday. That's very simplistic, obviously. And you might say, well, now you've made it more desirable and more interesting or something, right? The psychological laws will be complicated, but in the general, it just assume a basic psychological principle. If you put friction against doing something, you're going to create less of it in the aggregate. You might attract a weird kind of pervert who, who suddenly likes the idea. And so psychological laws would require a lot of really careful psychology. Here's something interesting. The most common result of a design psychological intervention is the opposite of the desired one. So psychology is complicated, but in any case, we won't go into that. That's not important for this. To understand Schlick's argument is to say simply that deterrence makes sense for punishment. It makes sense in a sense of moral responsibility. And so does the analogous case of praise and, and laudation and, and reward for people who do admirable things. All of that makes sense. All of it's true, and it's only true because of two things. One, because we're free, and two, because we behave regularly. And that's what we mean by determinism, is that it's describable by laws. Even if they're complicated psychological laws, the laws could describe why people were, are doing what they're doing. And you need both of those. Both of those are necessary for ethics. Both of them are necessary for moral responsibility. So he's saying both of these at the same time. And... Um, that's a heck of a good argument. It's it's a very, from an ethicist perspective, it's a very positive compatibilist case. And we sort of see his tone earlier in this essay where he's saying, um, not just I can fix the problem and show that you can have both. He's having sort of contempt for the compatibilist. I'm sorry, contempt for the determinist and contempt for the libertarians, the what Mill calls the metaphysical libertarians. He's saying, you guys are wrong. You're messing up freedom. You're messing up science and determinism. You're getting both of them wrong in a way that's damaging to two things that really matter. And from an ethical perspective, we need both of them. And you guys are screwing up what we need for moral responsibility. All right, uh, let's continue. <clears throat> Hence, the question regarding responsibility is the question, who in a given case is to be punished? Who is to be considered the true wrongdoer? This problem is not identical with that, with that regarding the original instigator of the act or the great-grandparents of the man from whom he inherited his character might in the end be the cause or the statesmen who are responsible for the social milieu and so forth. But the doer is the one upon whom the motive must have acted in order with certainty to have prevented the act or called it forth, as the case may be. Consideration of remote causes is of no help here. For in the first place, their actual contribution cannot be determined, and in the second place, they are generally out of reach. Rather, we must find the person in whom the decisive junction of causes lies. The question of who is responsible is the question concerning the correct point of application of the motive. And the important thing is that in this, its meaning is completely exhausted. Behind it, there lurks no mysterious connection between transgression and requital, which is merely indicated by the described state of affairs. It is a matter only of knowing who is to be punished or rewarded in order that punishment and reward function as such be able to achieve their goal. Thus, all the facts connected with the concepts of responsibility and imputation are at once made intelligible. We do not charge an insane person with responsibility for the very reason that he offers no unified point for the application of motive. It would be pointless to try to affect him by means of promises or threats when his confused soul fails to respond to such influence because its normal mechanism is out of order. 
We do not try to give him motives, but try to heal him. Metaphorically, we make his sickness responsible and try to remove its causes. When a man is forced by threats to commit certain acts, we do not blame him. But the one who held the pistol at his breast, the reason is clear. The act would have been prevented had we been able to restrain the person who threatened him. And this person is the one whom we must influence in order to prevent similar acts in the future. So let's recap that and then we'll stop reading and we'll do a different video to, to finish the reading of the Schlick part. But let's recap this argument of his because it all obviously pins on the idea that the reason why you try to punish or praise in the first place is to get rid of the source of bad actions. So for uh, in a moral sense, what I'm looking for is the source of the bad action in, in, in a causal way where if I put my finger here, I'm touching the thing that's making the bad action happen. And if that finger falls on the disease that made you insane, well, then I try to eradicate the disease. If it falls on the man who kidnapped your children and told you to go rob a bank for him and give him the money, I, I don't point at you for robbing the bank. I point at the man who's threatening you and making you rob the bank, right? I'm, the whole point is to find the source of the bad action and take it away. And sometimes the source of the bad action, if that's the point of looking for it in the first place, is obviously the person who chose to do the thing, right? That's what he's saying. That these fringe cases show us that we're right to point at this guy because he's the sort of guy who made that decision. That's all you need for moral responsibility. And you can't have moral responsibility like that, which is what you should desire to have, unless, one, the person is acting according to principles. Determinism has to be true for that to exist. And, and also that that determinism isn't compelling the guy, right? Because then you might say, well, wait a minute. The real source of the problem is the universe itself. And this is the thing that, that William James pointed out. He says, this determinism understood in the way that it's the actual cause makes me nihilistic. It makes me say, well, if this thing is regrettable, then so is the universe that made this thing have to happen. Being is regrettable, right? So there's this nihilism that is escapable perhaps from a determinist perspective. And William James suggests that maybe there's a way out of it. But he says, it certainly is forced upon you as a, a very negative possible attitude that you might be forced to or feel compelled to agree with if you believe in that. M Moritz Schlick is saying, hey, there's no such problem here because the reason Mill, I'm sorry, the reason William James, the reason Paul Ray, the reason uh, all of you determinists and libertarians are so upset about the fact that I'm not pointing at the guy who's the cause of the action because really determinism, if it were true, would take that away from him is that you don't understand that laws are descriptors of things. They're not compulsions of things. You are rightly pointing at the morally responsible person when you point at the person who made the decision to do the thing. And even he says that's only true because determinism is true, right? So he's not denying determinism the way William James would, and he's not embracing it the way Paul Ray would. He's saying, Paul Ray and William James, you're both confused, man. Determinism isn't that kind of thing. It's not compelling you to act, drawing all these connections to, well, the universe made me be what I am. <clears throat> the universe isn't the source of your actions. You are the one who is, if we affected you, we'd be changing the source of the action more than if we tried to affect whatever subtle or complicated and almost infinite things were true about the Big Bang that caused you to come into being. What a stupid way to think. That's Schlick's impulse. And there's something potentially dissatisfying to some of us in this course about this argument. And so it is picked up. That's where the weakness would be. But we'll talk about that during the class time. So I'm going to end this because it's getting pretty long. And we'll do a second video uh, to read the rest of Schlick.